Hello again, this is Douglas D. Ruggiero. I'm a physician assistant in Northwest Georgia. I've been practicing dermatology for the last uh, nearly 25 years. And this is Grand Browns with atopic dermatitis. This is our fourth episode. We've been reviewing two cases per episode. I'm excited to see the cases we have here. I'm honored to be with Dr. Lisa Swanson. Dr. Swanson, introduce yourself and maybe you can get us started. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Swanson, dermatologist and pediatric dermatologist in Boise, Idaho, land of potatoes. Happy to be here, excited to be here for session number four um, with two more very exciting cases to discuss. And the first one here is one of my patients. So this is a 13-year-old female with a history of dermatitis since birth. Uh, she's tried and failed triamcinolone and desinide. She's very itchy, especially behind her knees. And one thing that really gets in the way of her treatment plan is that she has some tactile sensitivities mm -hmm. where everything she tries to apply, medicine, moisturizer, everything, it has a, a high tendency to burn and sting. And so it makes topical regimens really difficult for her. These are some more pictures of her involved areas, really impressive involvement in the antecubital and popliteal fossa. And you can tell that she's very itchy. You can see some signs of lichenification in the popliteal fossa with some uh, pigmentary changes as well that are quite distressing to her. And so she is 13. And so really now we have a lot of options available for a patient like this. We could consider a more potent topical steroid. All she's done is triamcinolone uh, and desinide. We could consider a TCI maybe as part of a maintenance routine with a, a steroid for flares, a TCI for maintenance. We could consider roflumilast. Um, the 0.15% cream once a day um, to the affected areas. And I will say with regards to reflumilast, some of their before and after pictures show really remarkable improvement in post-inflammatory pigmentary change. Mm -hmm. And so that might be something that if I saw her today that, that I would think about more in detail. But I saw her before the approval of topical reflumilast. And so I thought about topical ruxolitinib. Um, twice a day, but very little risk of burning and stinging. And it has become a really great choice for me for patients with tactile sensitivities. I also, in all of my patients with tactile sensitivities, I will bring up systemic treatments because sometimes when that burning and stinging is so significant and they just can't tolerate anything, um, the idea of doing a shot twice a month or a pill a day um, is actually more appealing to them than trying another cream. Um, but this particular patient did choose to start topical ruxolitinib. She did beautifully, really remarkable improvement in her itch that occurred very quickly. She was very excited and very happy. Douglas, what are your thoughts about this? Would you have handled it any differently? Well, um, no, to, to answer your question, no. But I, I do like what you talked about with this tactile sensation that some patients have. Mm -hmm. I remember when... Um, a company that's not even around anymore when Fujisawa launched, um, you know, Tacrolimus uh, in 2000. I think Primicolimus came in 2001 or vice versa when these products came out. They originally were called topical immunomodulators, TIMS. And we called them TIMS at the very beginning. And then about a year and a half into it, a lot of the scientists and who were also dermatologists said, look, steroids are topical and immunomodulators. And they began, they changed the an acronym and the, to call them TCIs. But the first time I ever heard anyone uh, at a, in a lecture setting talk about stingers, you know, uh, with that was Mary Spraker. She's a pediatric dermatologist at Emory University, and I think it was the year 2000, and I heard her give her lecture at the AAD, and she, she talked about these kids in her practice that she called stingers, no matter what you put on them. Didn't matter if it was vanity cream, uh, the, the most bland oil on them, they always complained of stinging. Yeah. And so, and, and certainly with, uh, with the TCIs, more so with, uh, with tacrolimus than, than permiculimus, we saw the stinging was certainly the case, and certainly the case with chrysoboral, which you know, launched many years later in 2014. So I think that's an important thing. That's why samples are so important. That's why it's nice having these companies that sample these products where you can pick a small spot on the back of the hand and put a small amount on there, prove to them right there in the room that it's okay to put this on. And, you know, and I think what, what you've seen with topical ruxolitinib, I've seen too, I, you know, the instance of stinging is just so low um, that, um, that these patients tolerate very well. We used to have to go with the high potency topical steroid, heal the skin, get the barrier intact, and then you could transition over. It wasn't necessarily kind of um, a treatment paradigm that required steroids all the time. It just required 
acquired it so they wouldn't sting and then would be willing to use it, the maintenance medicine long term. And, uh, and so I think that as we get both, you know, topical rifumilas and topical uh, tepenorof into our hands and one with the rifumilas already being indicated and tepenorof likely coming, that these two products are going to have very low incidence of, of uh, stinging and very high tolerability as well. But, uh, but certainly the topical jack inhibitor is a great choice, uh, you know, with lung, you know, less than 20% body surface area and uh, in order to really give them some relief. So, yeah. but you know, I, it's, it's I, good. They're 13 and this is important at this age. These kids are in middle school, early high school, hyperpigmentation, scratching, itching, how they look, how they're perceived. You know, that's why you, you, you know, I'm always planting the seed for a systemic, you know, just because if, you know, that sometimes the kids at this age group are very eager to get as clear as they can because they're beginning to really put themselves out socially and, uh, and that's important to them. I love that you mentioned the importance of samples because that's what I do for all the tactilely sensitive kids. I say, I think, you know, I think this would be a good option for you, but let me go grab a sample right now and we'll put it on your skin and mm -hmm. we'll make sure that you tolerate it so they don't get home and they're maybe they're too afraid to use it and they never use it. And so I can show them in the office that it doesn't burn and sting. I think we were all burned unintended by the chrysoboral experience because we were set up to think that burning and stinging rates were low. And then we started using it and it was like a third to a half of patients were having this really intolerable burning and stinging. And so I think when topical roflumilas launched, everybody had a little bit of PTSD thinking about, oh my gosh, another phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor are really, are we really in for it this time? But they did really extensive studies on burning and stinging. They had a master formulator help create the vehicle and um you know it's been it's been a good experience topical reflumelast has been out for a couple months now I haven't gotten a single call about burning and stinging and it was immediate angry phone calls when Chris Aborol came out. So I feel like the real life use has been, has been good in that respect too. So that's yes. exciting. Yeah. It's funny. I don't call it PTSD. I call it PTCD, post-traumatic yeah. Chris Aborol, you know, so, you know, it was so traumatic. It's, uh, it was traumatic on us. It was. Oh, so well, this, this next case, uh, as you can see here, this is a 29-year-old African-American female with a history of atopy since a young child uh, but with significant involvement in the areola and the nipple. This too, now she didn't have tactile sense, you know, sense sensory problems, but uh, but this area burns, as you can imagine, look how fissured, just look how irritated that skin looks. And you can imagine that she says almost anything you put on it just makes it just burn and sting because it's just so fissured and cracked, you know, and so they don't want any more. The primary care doctor has said, I, you know, has said, I'm not giving you any more steroid creams, you know? So she came to us, not really saying I have to have steroid creams, but really saying, you know, they're refusing to give me more. What are my options, you know, for this? And if you look very closely underneath the mammary fold, you can see three or four lines of striae that have formed underneath that area from her using steroid creams around that area over the span of several years. Mm -hmm. So she already had, she didn't know what those were. She thought it was just some type of stretch marks from her wearing her, um, her underwire, mm -hmm. but those weren't stretch marks. They were all in steroid induced uh, atrophy and striae that, that were there. The, one of the teaching points of this is just, you know, a lot of things can present in a lot of different areas. We talked about in one of the previous episodes, looking for things, not just looking at things. And you can see that at the top right, that number, or eczema presentation, you can see how that has a little bit of a different appearance when they have a circular patch of eczema itself. Some would argue that this is a variant of atopic dermatitis, that this has got the same kind of cyto cytokine signature if you were to biopsy it and do and do kind of some translational studies on it, the numbular eczema and maybe mild cirrhosis or chronic eczematous eczema in the elderly are all variants of AD. But I think you have that sharply demarcated uh, kind of almost a crust-like lamen or crust-like lesion that it really fits that diagnosis of of nominal eczema. You can see at the bottom with Paget's carcinoma, always a consideration, and then Bowen's carcinoma with the patient on the bottom left uh, underneath. So the two on the left are actually my patients, and the two on the right are images captured from other providers. But you can see the Bowenoids carcinoma down there that came back as superficial squamous cell carcinoma being treated as a nominal eczema and atopic for uh, almost two years before the biopsy. So 
All I'm saying is that we are so comfortable managing uh, atopic dermatitis without doing biopsy. Uh, but when you get into these specialty areas or sensitive areas, and if they don't have a lot of extensive involvement of AD and other areas, and it's an adult, uh, then you may want to put on your thinking cap as is kind of one of the teaching points here. But, but you can see with this patient, this was, uh, again, I'm not trying to make this, uh, you know, topical ruxolitinib heady here, but it was discussed uh, and we did go with that. Again, another thing where we had all of our traditional TCIs at our disposal. This patient had already been tried on chrysoboral, burned like crazy. So she had that, that post-traumatic chrysoboral syndrome that, that was there. That wasn't the option. We weren't going to go with steroids because we've already seen atrophy and striae around the area. Didn't have the other topical PDE4 uh, available at the time, although it would have been a good uh, uh, option to consider if, uh, if this was the case. So this is a scenario where I walked out of the room also. I grabbed a sample tube. I went and had my nurse go in. So I had my nurse come back in. We're going to let you guys apply this to one small area, just one edge, you know, the top edge, not across the whole area. Just pick an area and let, put this medicine on. Then put your bra back on. Let me have you sit here for a couple minutes and let's just see how it feels. And uh, she said, sat in the room for a couple minutes. I went back in when she had gotten her, her top on. I said, how does it feel? She says, it's not burning or stinging. So if it's not burning or stinging, I'm willing to use it. You know, she, I wouldn't expect her to hey, see any you know, changes um, in, in that short period of time. But this is why I I've have on this slide here, we're thinking beyond steroidals, not just thinking for non-steroidals. We're starting to you know, change the way that we view things beyond steroidals. And these new novel topicals are allowing us to do that. Now, one thing we haven't talked about in this episode, which we have mentioned in the others, it's just working through the box warning inclusion with this topical ruxolitinib that carries the same box warning as its oral brothers and sisters. And I do have to mention this to, to these patients, and I do every single time, because again, as we've said, I want them to hear it from me and not from someone on TikTok or some other person that's there, because I feel like that I can tell them that, you know, I don't want, my number one priority for you is your safety, first and foremost, and I'm not going to do anything that I feel like is unsafe to you and that I wouldn't use myself or give my wife or give my anybody else that I feel like is in, that's an age, age appropriate to be on this medication. But here's why these things things are there. And I kind of just go through them and say, you know, in another in another trial, in an oral form, in a different disease state, you know, they saw that some of these uh, some of these uh, side effects, and even even in those populations, it simply showed that these, this incidence of these side effects were more prevalent than people who were on a different systemic medicine when they compared the two. And so I'm aware of these things, I'm very aware of it. I want you to know that uh, that I feel very great about you moving forward with this topical medication. So, and uh, and she responded very very well, um, and was was very very happy. So, what are the expectations I would give as we uh, with this? I, when I hand out the, this cream, my, my expectation is that look, you should really see some relief really in the first two to three days but you'll progressively feel that it's better a week out. And then by the time you get to two weeks out, you're gonna really see that, man, I think that this for her, I don't have a follow-up photo, all of this areola tissue completely remodeled. It looks smooth. She said, it looked like it used to look like when I was young, because she's had such a, you know, kind of um, like kenified plaque-like uh, uh, areola for a very long time. And so for her, even this is a hidden area, it was it's such a change in her countenance in the way she views herself to have this area of her body kind of restored you know it was just as important to her as it was if it was on her face you know I, I think this is a really excellent case because it's really an example of a situation where we we cannot use topical steroids here because mm -hmm. she's been using them for a while she's got the the strie already so this is a no steroid situation and so if you try to use something like a tci or a crisoboral you're going to want to prime it with steroids. Otherwise, this is going to burn and sting like crazy with either of those treatments. And so those seem unappealing because you can't even prime it with the steroid. And so these are one of the days where I'm just so grateful to have tools like topical rucks in the toolbox, because it's going to be strong enough to help this poor woman as quickly as possible and safe enough in its non-steroid preparation that we can put it 
on this sensitive area. And so this is really this is really a, a fantastic case uh, and fantastic use of topical rexolitinib. You know, it it's nice to have topical roflumilas now. It'll be nice to have topical topinarov, but I don't know if either of those are going to be able to offer the speed of improvement that topical rux does. Um, topical rux is exceptionally fast, and so for a, a patient who's struggling so much with this sensitive area, um, it's a blessing to have topical rux to be able to offer mm -hmm. to her i think that was brilliant yeah i'm glad she did well yeah well this kind of brings us to a close of our fourth episode i don't know about you but i have had a great time going through these cases and i've learned a lot from you and you know to me it's important to realize that we learn a lot not just from hearing about new things that you never heard of before but you hear and it confirms the things that you're doing so you've confirmed a lot of what i do and i like to know that the things that i'm experimenting with and trying and trusting are being used by someone like you that i consider to be the top in the country and then i've also also learn a lot of new things also. So thank you very much for allowing me to do this with you, Dr. Swanson. Thank you, Douglas.